Right now, it doesn't matter who you put in front of the New York Mets. This lineup is built to rake. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode of Locked On Mets is brought to you by Tax Network USA. Did you know that it's never too late to resolve your tax issues with the IRS? Don't wait. Reduce your tax debt and get help from a team of licensed tax professionals by calling 1-800-549-1000 or visit TNUSA.com slash locked on. Now, when we were previewing this series on yesterday's show, I talked about the pitching matchups. I said, look, Garrett Cole, Luis Heal going up against David Peterson and Sean Maniah. The Yankees have the edge in both of these matchups, even though Cole was coming off the IL. This is his second start since being hurt for the entire season. But it's still Garrett Cole. And he looked pretty good his first time out. So you look at a matchup where it's him versus David Peterson, and it felt like the Mets were at a real disadvantage. But what we've learned about this Mets team lately is you throw Dylan Cease in front of them. What do they do? They pile on double-digit runs. You throw John Gray in front of them, and he's having a great year. Double-digit runs on the game. Shota Imanaga, double-digit runs. I mean, the New York Mets, if you put a great start in front of them, it doesn't matter. They are just going about their process, grinding out great at-bats, and making it tough on guys. And Garrett Cole opened up this game, and I thought he looked pretty good. He was touching 96, 97. I think I might have even seen a 98. He was throwing hard. He looked like Garrett Cole, but the Mets were, were battling. They were hanging in there. Francisco Lindor had a leadoff double to start things out, and Lindor has been ridiculous starting off games. They said the stat during the game today that his on-base percentage leading off games is 558, which is ridiculous, and I feel like a lot of those have been leadoff doubles. Brandon Immo drew a walk, but then – J.D. Martinez hits into a double play, and it looked like Cole could have an easy inning. Lindor standing on third, two outs. Pete Alonso comes up. Maybe he didn't want to deal with Pete. He ends up walking him. And then here comes Francisco Alvarez. And I think what has taken this lineup to another level lately is you have Alvarez just giving you great at-bats. And you have Mark Vientos, who's been this steadying presence near the bottom third of the lineup, but just gives you another guy in that seven hole that gives you that little extra punch in that bottom third of your lineup. So here's Alvarez, falls behind the count, works another walk, really good at bat. Tyrone Taylor gets a hit, and so the Mets score a run. I thought it was a really bad send uh, to try to have Alonso score from second on a ball that got to left field in a hurry, and Alex Verdugo has a good arm. It was as easy of a play as you can imagine. He hit the catcher on the fly, and Alonso was out by a mile. And that honestly could have stopped the Mets from scoring even more runs because Mark Fantos would open up the next inning with a home run because Garrett Cole maybe thought bomb in the lineup. This is my chance to preserve my pitch down count. He was at 28 pitches through the first inning, probably really tired after that. Okay. This is a guy that used more than a third of his pitches for the day in that first. And Mark Vientos gets a pitch that's up in her half crushed it. So that's a home run for Vientos. Harrison Bader, a couple batters later, fastball up right down the middle. He yanks it out for a home run. Mets up 3-0. Cole has a decent third inning, although Alvarez worked another walk. Fourth inning, I think he was just tired at that point. And you can make all the excuses in the world if you're a Yankees fan for Garrett Cole. And they're, they are fair. He was at 91 miles per hour when Mark Vientos took him deep again in the fourth. So I think he was at 93 when he took him deep in the second. So it it was a steady decline on the velocity, and that's going to happen for a guy that is coming off an injury, second start, and a grueling first inning. But you have to credit the Mets for putting him in a lot of bad spots. So Vientos, like I said, hits that home run, a laser to the opposite field. It hits off the top of the fence, goes over the wall. Um, And, you know, you've seen him now show power to each foul line. It's, It's pretty impressive what Vientos can do. Jeff McNeil had a decent day. He got a knock there. Harrison Bader hit one hard, but right at Glaber Torres. Francisco Lindor popped out, so you got two outs. McNeil still on, and Brandon Nimmo hits a home run, two-run shot. That puts the Mets up 6-0. 
Garrett Cole, four innings pitched, seven hits, four walks. That's a big number. Six runs, and here's another big number, zero strikeouts. Just a masterclass by the Mets offense. And again, you can give Cole his excuses, but you also have to give the Mets credit. And they're out again in the sixth inning off of old friend Phil Bickford, who looks so much better, by the way. You, know, you see some guys who go to the Yankees and they get cleaned up with the, the hair and, and, and clean shaven. And you're like, man, that guy looks so much worse. Phil Bickford looks like a new person and, and a much more respectable person. I thought he looked great. In that inning, Jeff McNeil and Harrison Bader each got singles from the bottom part of the lineup. They also each stole a base. McNeil stole second before Bader got his hit. Didn't read the ball well when Bader did get that knock, but it wouldn't have mattered because Aaron Judge has a cannon. So I don't think McNeil scored from second on that base hit anyway. Then Bader still second. So you got runners at second and third for the top of the lineup. Francisco Lindor, good at bat. Honestly, he fell behind 0-2 and worked a long at bat against Phil Bickford, which probably tired him out a little bit, but he struck out. Brandon Nimmo hits a ground ball to Torres that could have gotten out at the plate, but Torres made a lazy play. Ball gets under his glove. Mets are fortunate to score there. And then J.D. Martinez rips a double over Aaron Judge's head. Pete Alonso cashes in another with a sack fly. And the Mets at that point are up 9-1 to one at the end of six. Juan Soto had homered earlier in the game. But I want to talk about Aaron Judge because Aaron Judge put on his cape and nearly led the Yankees back into this game. He ends the bottom of the sixth inning, making a diving catch on a low line drive from Francisco Alvarez that would have scored another run. Then in the seventh inning, off of Daniel Nunez, he hits an RBI double that drives in one. Nunez was really good in this game. He came on to relieve Peterson in the fifth inning. Peterson had left a couple on due to walks. That was after he gave up a home run to Juan Soto for that first run. And Nunez gets a huge double play ball. Then he pitched a one, two, three, sixth, went back out for the seventh. And that's where he got hurt a little bit on that double by Judge. But that was really it. So Nunez was definitely the best reliever of the day. Eighth inning is where this game got scary. Adam Adovino comes on to pitch and mop up duty, which is his new role. And honestly, this is a guy that might get DFA. I mean, you could see it. The writing could be on the wall, honestly, because he has not pitched well. Gives up a base hit, gets a hard out, then walks a batter. And Carlos Mendoza had seen enough, didn't want to see the game get away from him. He goes to Danny Young. Danny Young gives up a base hit that scores one. He then gets a strikeout, but walks Juan Soto to loan the bases. They don't want Aaron Judge to face a lefty. So here comes Reed Garrett for the four-out save. And Garrett gets ahead 0-2. And for some reason, the pitch call was, I think, a fastball low and away. Now, you better get it low and away. And I think the thought was maybe Aaron Judge would be taking that pitch, expecting a slider out of the zone. So if you throw a fastball low and away, you might get one by him. And Reed Garrett did throw a 99 miles per hour, but you better get it low and away, not right down the pipe, which is where he threw the ball. And Aaron Judge took 99 miles per hour in and put it about 110 miles per hour out, hits a grand slam and made that game way too close for comfort. 9-7 after the grand slam. So... We were all nervous, I'm sure, as Garrett went back out there for the ninth inning. But a one, two, three, ninth, big save from Garrett. A weird occurrence where you can give up a grand slam and you did your job because you held on, you got the victory, you got four outs. And it's going to be a, a battle here with Edwin Diaz on the injured, or not the injured list, on, on Edwin Diaz suspended. Uh, you saw in this game, it took what? Eight outs from Nunez and four from Garrett to get through. You need length out of your starting pitchers. Peterson did not give the Mets that, and yet I still thought it was a pretty decent start. I want to tell you why in the next segment. First, though, a word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience are what brings home the winning trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. With eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. 
Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Today's episode is also brought to you by LinkedIn. Are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever, and that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers and surface key signals, such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That's linkedin.com slash locked on for a free 60-day trial. That LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. There was big NBA news on Tuesday night as Michael Bridges got traded from the Nets to the Knicks. If you want to be up to date on all the latest from both sides of that trade, make sure you check out Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube, which covers everything in the world of sports. All right, let's talk about David Peterson. It was a wild night for Peterson. We'll go through all the stats. Four and a third innings pitch on 103 pitches. Not good. Three hits, one earned run against the New York Yankees. Very good. Five walks, that's bad. Eight strikeouts, that's very good. And some strikeouts in some big spots. David Peterson showed a lot in that first inning. Gives up a leadoff single to Anthony Volpe. Then he walks Juan Soto, and he walks Aaron Judge. Now, this Yankees lineup is currently a two-man team. And the two guys are so damn good that it doesn't even matter. But there's really no one else to fear outside of Soto and Judge. They're the two. The other guys, you can pitch to. So you understand him being careful with Soto and Judge to start out the game. But then you got to make pitches because his base is loaded, nobody out. You can't walk anybody. And if you come in the zone and you leave a pitch out over the heart of the plate, there are guys that can still do damage against you. He strikes out Gleyber Torres. Then he strikes at Alex Verdugo. And then old friend J.D. Davis comes up. And I know Mets fans were thinking, "Uh uh-oh. I mean, J.D. Davis has not been good this year, but it's a former Met. Well, David Peterson escaped the jam, striking out J.D. Davis. So three strikeouts with the bases loaded, nobody out. Unbelievable. I think that gave the lineup some momentum, quite honestly, because you go from feeling like you're definitely going to be trailing to, wow, the Yankees didn't score there. And then the Mets give Peterson some runs. Second inning, he hit a batter, but other than that, was really solid. Struck out two more, did not allow a run. Third inning, Juan Soto leads off, pitches to him, gets a ground out. And then he hit Aaron Judge in the elbow guard, and it was almost like the friendliest intentional hit-by-pitch you'd ever see. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but he hit him in the one place it wouldn't hurt him. It was just like, I don't want to pitch you. Go take your base. Instead of putting up the four fingers and just letting him walk, it was, all right, I'll just just hit you in the elbow. I don't want to deal with you. Then he struck out Glaber Torres, gets a ground out to get out of that inning. Fourth inning, he works around a walk and a single, two more strikeouts, has to face Volpe, who is the only other hitter that scares you even a little bit in the Yankees lineup right now. And with a runner in scoring position, got another big strikeout to get out of the fourth without giving up a run. Fifth inning, Juan Soto hits a home run, leadoff homer against him. Now, he at that point was pitching with a 6 nothing lead, so it made sense to go after those guys, get Aaron Judge to fly out, But then I think he was gassed at that point because he just didn't look good to the last two batters he faced. Walks them both. Pitch count goes over 100. And then they go to the bullpen and word it broke down what happened from there. But looking at what David Peterson has done up to this point this season, it's five starts, 3.67 ERA, 1.48 whip. To me, he has been better than Tyler McGill. Obviously, the ERA and the whip are, the whip is slightly better. The ERA is significantly better, but McGill just had a really rough outing. We've seen Peterson pitch deeper into games um, and and hold his stuff a little bit longer. We've also seen him get out of some really tight jams, make big pitches in big spots. I've always been a David Peterson guy over Tyler McGill. Okay, I've been wrong more than I've been right about Peterson in a lot of ways because I 
have always believed that this guy had the ability to be a really good starting pitcher in the big leagues. We haven't seen him put it all together. 2022 is the closest version of it. I think he's scratching the surface, but because of where the Mets roster sits right now with the Edwin Diaz suspension, there's every chance that David Peterson's about to be optioned on Wednesday because I was expecting Tyler McGill to get optioned and they did not do that. Now, my case for why you'd still option McGill over Peterson to get an extra arm in your bullpen is because you're going to face Houston at the end of this week. I think David Peterson is flatly better, but there is a world the Mets actually option both of these guys. So it's a matter of who's going to get optioned first, potentially, and that's where it gets a little bit funny. Maybe the Mets would rather have Tyler McGill make a start on Sunday against the Astros over Peterson on regular rest, which is justifiable. But Peterson or McGill could make that start. The Mets just have to make their pick on who actually does. But there is a world where both these guys get options. So that's what I want to go through here. Now, you have Jose Budo. You have Christian Scott. Both ready to go. Scott pitched tonight in Syracuse. Um, you know He'll be good to go next week if you need him. Jose Budo, same thing. Because you're dealing with a short bullpen with that Diaz, you can option one of these two guys on Wednesday, option the other one on Sunday. Now, what that would do for you is on or option other one on Monday after they start on Sunday. On Monday, you could bring up Christian Scott or Jose Budo. I think it would probably be Budo first because he can start on five days rest. What that would do for you, right, is whoever you option on Wednesday would then be eligible to return on July 11th. Here's where the Mets get creative. You got Sean Manaya going against the Yankees. I think they might start Severino on regular rest to open up the Astros series. You got Quintana. And then I would throw Peterson because the Astros have been better against righties and lefties this year. Regardless, doesn't matter which one you pitch. You option that guy. You bring up Budo. It then goes to start next week. Manaya, Budo, Quintana, or excuse me, Manaya, Budo, Severino, Quintana. And then you can call up Christian Scott Friday, July 5th. If that's the way you do it, Edwin Diaz returns on the 6th. So the only other day throughout this suspension where you would have to pitch with a short bullpen would be when Christian Scott came up. That's why you'd make the move to option both Peterson and McGill because it'd give you that ultimate flexibility. And then whoever you option first, they can come back around and be your sixth starter when you need to give Christian Scott a day. And that's why I would pitch Budo first when you're promoting these two guys to open up July potentially, because then you can go, you can basically turn the rotation right back around once Diaz returns, have it Minaya, Budo, Quintana, Severino, insert a six starter or a spot starter You could even throw Joey Lucchese if you wanted to. Or maybe it's McGill for a spot start and you set him right back down. And then that carries you throughout the all-star break. And the reason why I would start Severino on Friday is because that would allow Severino to get one additional start before the the, uh, all-star break. So we'll see. We'll see how the Mets decide to navigate it. I know that's convoluted, but I just wanted to sort of break down the process here, because I was talking a lot about McGill getting option. I still think that happens, but I almost think that you're going to see both McGill and Peterson get optioned as the Mets try to navigate this period with that Diaz the best that they possibly can. They're also going to be without Starling Marte, though. He's officially hit the IL. Ben Gamble came up. I want to talk through that decision by the Mets, so we'll get into that in just a minute. First, though, another word from our sponsors. Today's episode of Locked On Mets is brought to you by Tax Network USA. We pride ourselves here on giving you the latest news for your team, whether it's the offseason, the draft, spring training, playoffs, and we're here for you all year round. You know what else is all year round? Collection season. Just because tax season's over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes. The IRS can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, can even seize your property. Don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax experts at Tax Network USA Go to bat for you. With over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved their clients over $1 billion in tax debt. Whether you owe taxes, have complicated matters that require tax planning, or finally hit that parlay this season and need help correctly filing, call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. You can also just see the link in the episode description 
below. Today's episode is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and you watch the winnings roll in. Get in the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. So you could turn $10 into $1,000. If you're looking for promotions, Prize Picks has got you covered every week from lowering select player stats projections on Tuesdays to help your lineup hit or getting your entry fees back if you have a losing lineup on Fridays. Download the Prize Picks app today and start playing. Use the code Locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code Locked on MLB on Prize Picks for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. If you're an everyday listener of the show, make sure you become a Locked on Mets insider. This is our texting service where you get updates for me anytime some news breaks on the Mets. So today, let you all know of the insiders that is that Ben Gamble was coming up, and I gave you some stats on why that was the decision that was made. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, find the link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. So we knew Sterling Marte was about to hit the IL. We did learn more about the timetable today, though. So he has to rest for two weeks, but that does not mean he can return in two weeks. The quickest he could return is four weeks from now, so after the All-Star break. And that's best-case scenario. They can look at him in two weeks, and that inflammation in his knee it might still be there. In which case, who knows? Does he get an injection? What's going to happen? These things can linger. So the Mets right now have a hole in right field. And I think that's why they went to get Ben Gamble. Because he has been the best outfielder that the Mets have had in AAA this year. You look at him or Trace Thompson are really the two clear outfielders that you'd feel comfortable playing in right field in the big leagues that have big league experience. And you compare the two, and I don't think there's much of a contest. Yes, Trace Thompson has 16 home runs. But Ben Gamble was hitting 314, Thompson 228. Gamble at 423 on base, Thompson a 300 on base. Gamble 538 slug, Thompson even with all those home runs a 500 slug. OPS difference of 161 points. Gamble a 961 OPS, Thompson an 800 OPS. Now, if you look at who has been best this year in AAA versus right-handed pitching. There's Brett Beatty, but that's a small sample size. And then it's Ben Gamble, who leads the team with an OPS of 996. Now, here's the interesting part. I almost feel like Ben Gamble was also given the call here because he can hang in there versus left-handed pitching. Has he been great against lefties in his career? Not necessarily. Big league lefties are certainly a lot better than lefties in AAA. With that said, look at the splits that you have from the potential options the Mets have in right field right now. You have DJ Stewart against lefties. He's 0 for 9 this year. They've been shielding him. Tyrone Taylor, a 506 OPS against left-handed pitching. Got a big hit in the game today. It was against Garrett Cole righty. Trace Thompson has brutal reverse splits, 571 OPS in AAA. He was not going to hit lefties in the big leagues because that holds true for, for what he's done throughout his career as well. Ben Gamble, an 846 OPS against left-handed pitching. Ultimately, I think the thought process here is Ben Gamble is the best option if you need a starting right fielder. Now, DJ Stewart's going to get some run. We saw Tyrone Taylor get some run, and he gives you a premier defensive outfielder out there, and maybe that's the move. Maybe you just play Tyrone Taylor, and you let him hit against righties, and maybe, who knows, if he's playing close to every day, maybe he starts to come around against lefties too. That might be the way the match should go to just lean into defense at that spot. He's clearly the best option on that front because Ben Gamble is not a great defensive outfielder. He's just a guy that has plenty of experience playing in the big leagues in right field. But is he even a huge upgrade over DJ Stewart? I I wouldn't necessarily say that he is. I think these guys are both below average. But Gamble might be the best hitting option that the Mets are going to have at that spot. The other option is Jeff McNeil, sliding him into right field. But clearly with this move, the Mets are extending some more time with McNeil at second base. He has been a second baseman far more this year than he's played the outfield. And he's starting to play a really good defensive second base. I think the Mets value that. They value the defense they've been getting from McNeil and Iglesias up the middle, along with Lindor, who's always stellar. Now, 
I actually went back and forth a lot today with somebody on Twitter about Luis and Helicuna. He wanted Acuna. I don't think Acuna was even on the short list of guys that could get promoted here. And the reason why I say that is because Acuna, he started to hit in May. He started to come around a little bit, but still wasn't elite production. And even now it hasn't been elite production. He's been very good in June. Over his last 30 days, his OPS has been over 800. That's great. But even with that, his OPS over the last 30 days has been right around the middle of the pack. It's been close to league average. I couldn't find the actual league average OPS in the International League, but the pitching is not good there. Okay. Uh, Brett Beatty homer tonight off of Aaron Sanchez. You remember Aaron Sanchez? He was once a really good pitcher for the Blue Jays. I think he's got an ERA over 12 for whatever affiliate he's with. I didn't even check, but not very good. So the pitching is not great there. If you think that Acuna is going to take what has been a successful month and translate that to big league pitching, you are asking a lot. And I don't think the Mets have gotten to a point, as much as everyone might hate Jeff McNeil, where they're not going to play him. And you're going to play Iglesias against left-handed pitching. He has raked. Granted, is he due to come down to earth? Absolutely. He's not going to hit 400 all year against lefties. But... He's worth playing right now, and you're not going to just bench McNeil. Yes, you could have slid McNeil into right, played Acuna in a platoon, but you want Luis Anil Acuna playing every single day right now. You don't want him in a part-time role. That's not good for his development, especially if he's going to come up and get absolutely blown up by big league pitching, which is what I think is going to happen because there's a massive gap between big league pitching and triple A pitching. I think the best way to really understand that Look at what Brett Beatty's doing in AAA. Mentioning Homer again, he's not getting challenged by AAA pitching. That's the problem right now for Beatty. He needs to be in the big leagues to develop. He's at that stage of his career. He's not gaining anything with this swing in AAA. He's just varsity playing with JV. But Mark Vientos deserves to be in the lineup every single day. And so that's why I think the Mets made the move to not call up Brett Beatty in this spot. Beatty was my prediction. I was wrong. I thought that they would just go with best possible player. What this tells me is they don't love their op their options for right field. And they're not ready to just slide McNeil into right. That's what this tells me. And they're also probably not comfortable with Brett Beatty playing consistently at second base yet, which is fair. Beatty did make an error today, but it was at third base funny enough. But I think that was the decision behind this move. It was, we need to get a option for our right field mix we are very comfortable with the platoon at second with Iglesias and McNeil. I think that's where the Mets are at. I think they are at this stage happy to roll with that platoon until the trade deadline. And then if at that point, Jeff McNeil still hasn't hit, I imagine they're going to shop him by eating down his contract and see if they can find a suitor. And we'll talk about that at some point before the deadline. Or I think they will relegate him to a bench role where he will be a utility guy that's not going to play as much, and maybe they make a move for a second baseman. Maybe Brett Beatty has played enough at second base that they're comfortable with that. That's a decision for another day. But right now, I think they're fine at second base. They love their situation at third, short, first, left, center, the way Harrison Bader's playing. Right field is the one area where they got to figure something out until Marte comes back. And I think ultimately the decision was Ben Gamble has hit the best in AAA. He's the best option to potentially do that at the big league level because he also has the big league experience compared to like a guy like Luke Ritter who hasn't played right field and doesn't have big league experience. And this is going to be a role where Ben Gamble is going to be mixing up time with Taylor, with Stewart. I also think there's a role where Ben Gamble is going to win a fourth outfielder job for the Mets if he can keep hitting the way he has in AAA, or at least some semblance of that in the big leagues. It could be similar the way Iglesias has come up and made himself invaluable as a bench piece on this roster, you might find that Gamble is the guy that should be the fourth outfielder when Marte comes back. And DJ Stewart, who has an option, might get sent down because Gamble, he had to be DFA'd when he's t- taken off this roster. And if he hits, that might be the decision the Mets make. I like the move. It makes a lot of sense. When you're armed with the hindsight, you can kind of see why they put the puzzle together the way they did. I understand why Bay didn't get called up. And I absolutely understand why they didn't even consider Acuna. Ritter, I understand not calling him up either. I think it probably was a decision between Thompson and Gamble. And with that, 
not really much of a decision to make their gamble the clear fit for this club. Another quick note about Syracuse in tonight's game, Brett Beatty, Homer, man and air, told you about that. Acuna, two for five, two strikeouts. Christian Scott made a start. That's worth mentioning. Four innings pitched, four hits allowed, one earned run off a solo homer. Three walks, three strikeouts, 81 pitches. So he's still stretched out, ready to join a big league rotation whenever he's asked to. Wilkin Ramos, one guy I wanted to talk about. Two scoreless innings of relief. He is 23 years old. He had a great start to the season in double A last year. He split the year between high A and double A and pitched to a two five Oh ERA this year in double A 16 games, 21 and a third innings pitched 20 strikeouts, a one, two, seven ERA got the call to triple a two scoreless appearances up to this point. So Wilkin Ramos, a name to watch who could join the Mets bullpen at some point this year. Also Cole Solcer pitched a scoreless ninth inning in Syracuse. That tells me that Solcer is not going to be the arm. Add to the bullpen if the Mets choose to on Wednesday. I would think it's Josh Walker. So just leaving that one last little tidbit in there for you. And we'll see how the Mets fare in the second game of the Subway Series. Can they pull off a Subway Series sweep and get back to 500? I'll be discussing that game and more on tomorrow's edition of Locked On Mets. If you are listening on the audio side, make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Trying to make a push to 9,000 subs. So I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. If you want to follow me on X, you can do so at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, find the link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listener, your first watch every day. Now, for your second watch, check out Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24 7 on YouTube, which will keep you up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. NBA free agency and trades are all starting to pick up here. We're going to see a lot of action in the NBA, and they will have it all covered for you. Locked on Sports Today, which is also streaming 24-7 on Amazon Fire TV.